And just the temperature changes. When a person enters the cave that hasn't been entered in thousands of years, they're starting to fall off the walls. And unfortunately, the tourism board isn't trying to control it because, as we all know, living in Coeur d'Alene, tourism is very important for the economy. So that's one thing that we really need to be very careful about. The most famous cave paintings are in Lascaux, France. And these are absolutely incredible. They're from the Paleolithic era, and they're 17,000 years old. And like many of the most important archaeological finds, these were found by accident in 1940. A group of about four or five teenagers and their dog went missing. So they were trying to find their dog on their property, and the dog discovered this. One of the most famous things of all time, and one of the most important. Like the Cave of the Swimmers, this art has also suffered greatly due to the public. It was opened in 1940 as a giant site, and everyone that was important went there. Because, I mean, it's this incredible site. Although it looks small up here, one of these bulls is 17 feet long. So just to give you an idea, and it goes all the way around the cave. It was opened to the public in 1940, but it closed in 1963 because even then they were noticing degradation. It was restored and monitored, but in 1998 a fungus set in, and that covered part of the wall. And then in 2008, black mold started coming. So now one person is allowed inside for 20 minutes every three weeks, just to make sure that nothing completely horrific has happened. If you go to Lascaux, they will take you into a cave, and they will say, these are the glorious paintings of the Lascaux cave. It's not real. And that's a very good thing, because if it was, these would be completely gone by now. There are 2,000 figures, 900 animals, and due to specific types of animals and different little tiny things that people added to the painting, like the particular curve of the horn or the particular foot, 605 of them have been identified down to the species. One of the most interesting things about this is that art in, of this time was thought to be representative of the life that these people were li living. But there's not one image of reindeer, and reindeer just happened to be the number one food source of these people. But instead they focused on hunting scenes with bulls and aurochs, which is an extinct version of a bull that is way big. You never want to meet an auroch. Crossed hind legs of one of the aurochs is the first instance of real perspective of a three-dimensional animal. And that's extremely significant because that sort of perspective was not seen again until the Renaissance. It was just completely lost to time. Several archaeologists have claimed that there's an astronomical significance, that these line up particularly on different times of the year when the cave will line up perfectly during winter, but it never lines up perfectly. And people tend to just try to make their theory fit. There's also a theory that this was the product of sensory deprivation. A lot of people in ancient times used hallucinogenic substances to connect with their gods. So one of the theories is that an artist took hallucinogenic substances and then just decided to either paint or told someone else to paint what the gods were telling them. And you can see the scale on this is absolutely incredible. But you can also see how they're having to reinforce parts of it, and that lighting is extremely damaging to the paintings. And people are hoping that it'll last for a few more thousands of years, but you never know. One of the most famous pieces of artwork is the Venus of Willendorf. Now, you're probably looking and thinking, Venus, that's more like the Greeks and the Romans. Why is that thing called the Venus? It's a misnomer. When it was discovered in 1908, people thought, wow, that, that's a naked lady. That's automatically a Venus, because they were going through the height of the Greco-Roman art phase in America. So they thought, OK, here's this little limestone thing. It's a Venus. It was found in Austria, and it's 11 and a half centimeters high. And one of the interesting things about it is that it's tinted with red ochre. You can barely see it now, because it's 24,000 years old. But there was a red ochre all over it, not, not a design, just completely painted. And one of the best facts about this one is that it was found with Moldavite amulets next to it, not on it, next to it. Moldavites are formed by meteorites, and they're only found in one place in the world, which was a little bit far from where this was found. So no one knows how the Moldavite amulets got to it. No one knows if it's a tribute. No one knows how they even carved them. You have to note on this one the detailed and exaggerated genitalia, which also suggests that it's a fertility symbol. There's no feet, there's no head, the arms are basically these little tiny specks. So you have to think that it's gotta be a fertility object. One of the interesting things that a lot of ancient cultures have is that they exaggerate the knees. And we have absolutely no idea why. 
It's one of those misnomers where it's an artistic representation of people, but she doesn't have a face. She doesn't have hair. But it might be hair, it might be a headdress. As you can see in the diorama next to it, they could have been suggesting that this woman had curly hair, or she could have been wearing a hat, or her hair could have been braided. Because of the detail on it and the fact that it's 24,000 years old, we have absolutely no idea what it is. In addition to possibly being a fertility object, there's a thousand different ideas of what it could be. Some people have said it's a self-portrait of an artist, but my personal favorite is that it's a deity of the mushroom cult because she's supposed to look like a mushroom. <laughs> I love that. And I know you guys remember the better get around. Now can you see the human figure? It wasn't until I had them side by side where I was like, okay, that could be more than a rock. But it takes a little bit of imagination. Mesopotamia is the cradle of civilization, well, of Western civilization, let me be careful. The Fertile Crescent provided some of the most inspiring and amazing ideas that have come across Western civilization, and the artwork is no less amazing. On the left, you see the Victory Stella of King Naram Sim, which was the grandson of Sargon. It's 4,000 years old, and it's a Victory Stella. You can see him standing bigger than all of the other figures, and that was an ancient device for denoting the importance of him. He's standing on the graves, well not the graves, the bodies of all of his enemies, showing his dominion over them. And the people that aren't dead, including him, are all looking up at the sun, showing their devotion to the god that just ensured their victory. Remember what I told you about perspective. Do you notice anything odd about the king's size compared to the mountain? He's about 75% that height, and we don't really have the record of giant mountain man in Mesopotamia besides this. So it's all an issue of perspective. The figure that you see on the right is a Lamaso, which is also known as the Man Bull, and he guarded the gates of Assyrian palaces. He had a bull's body, the eagle's wings, and the man's head, and it was supposed to be a very protective deity. This particular one is 3,000 years old, and you can see it at the Metropolitan Museum of New York. This is actually from northern Iraq, possibly looted. We won't say that yet, though. It, gave, it guarded the palaces and temples because this was a protective deity that came to life if there was any sort of foe that needed to be defeated. And this was also a limestone relief carving. A lot of carvings, you just kind of work it into the fabric. But this, they would carve off an entire side and then work into it. But they wanted to keep that strength and that central square. You see, none of the legs are completely out of the relief. And if you look at those two little legs on the center, there's no possible realism to that. They, it would have to be about three inches wide, and not very protective of that. Another interesting thing to note about him is he is using the characteristic ancient archaic smile. Now, we have no absolute way to understand why he has the archaic smile. And a lot of ancient pieces had this, and we don't understand why. It's not a particularly threatening stance to be smiling at all of your enemies. But everyone from kings to gods, everyone had the same enigmatic smile. And rumor has it that's possibly why Leonardo da Vinci used that smile in the Mona Lisa. But we'll get to that later too. Egypt, everyone's favorite ancient land. I tried to stay away from the really, really well-known pieces so that you guys can get more out of this. That handsome couple up there is the pharaoh Menkure and his wife Kamenarenepti. Very hard to say. It is 4,500 years old. 